Hello. I'm glad we're back together again, even though it's over the waves, and it's uh, somewhat refreshing to at least know that some of us will see each other through this. We're looking at Matthew chapter 26, and as we prepare for the day, maybe you want to stop the video right now, head out to your kitchen, grab a piece of bread, and uh, maybe something to drink. Maybe you don't have grape juice in the house right now. That's all right. Just make it something to drink. When we get back together after this is all over, we'll have communion in big style. But today, let's recognize what Jesus was doing in this last meal. Take a moment and go get a few things. Good to have you back. Now we're looking at Matthew chapter 26, and it's that last supper meal. Uh, the meal was shared, usually by family, called together, and it had been celebrated for 1,500 years. That's a long time. It was recognizing God's salvation from the slavery of Egypt, which makes it a significant meal when you consider what was going to happen the next day upon the cross of Jesus Christ. The meal included several parts, and Jesus chose two parts of the meal for this communion that we would celebrate even to this day. The bread was not like this bread. Uh, it was the bread of haste, made without any yeast, and it was flat and not very tasty and crunchy and sort of like a cracker. It signified the fact that they had been in bondage and once they were given relief, release, they needed to leave quickly. And so it was put together quickly for the trip, the bread of haste, a part of the meal. So if you have your bread with you, let's partake of it together. Jesus took the bread and gave thanks for it. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that even though we might be separated by miles, we're unified in your spirit. Recognizing the body of our, of your, our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, we take this bread and we give you thanks for it. Recognizing his sacrifice on our behalf. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And then he broke it. And he gave it to all of his disciples to share in. Then he said, take it and eat it. Then Jesus took that last cup, and we know from the Seder ritual that it was either the fourth or the fifth cup, depending on which Seder you're celebrating. It was the cup of the Redeemer, the redeemed. It was a cup recognizing God redeeming his people and bringing them back to himself. It celebrated that. that and then after that, it's next year in Israel. It's a beautiful thought. Drinking to the fact that God wants to bring us back to himself. But Jesus takes it a notch higher. Then he took the cup saying, and gave thanks and offered it up to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. In verse 28, he's basically saying that this is something new. So obviously it recognized some, something old. When you go back to Exodus chapter 24, we have the first covenant in blood that's given to the people of Israel at the bottom of Sinai. And it was basically the blood of the, the uh, offering 
splattered on the people. Now, we don't think of that being very uh, cleansing. It was basically a sacrifice that they wore. And when you think about the Old Testament and how they sort of wore the laws, uh, the rituals and things of the Old Testament, the faith that they were living out had basically become something they wore on the outside. It was a, a covenant that they, they lived out on the outside rather than from the inside. But Jeremiah, and I believe this is what Jesus was talking about, was talking about a new covenant. If you turn to Jeremiah chapter 31, beginning in verse 31, Jeremiah records it this way. There is a time coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand and led them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant, covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will a man teach his neighbor or a man his brother saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. I believe this was echoing in the ears of Jesus as he was putting together this new covenant which would be in his blood. Because this covenant reflects the next day. It reflects the blood that Jesus would shed upon the cross for the forgiveness of sins. And he was saying it's no longer an outside covenant that you're going to wear on the outside like a ritual or do on the outside like a law. You're going to take it in. It's going to become part of you. It will give you life from the inside out. So if you would, take your cup with me. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the cup. We thank you for the fact it represents your blood. Such deep love, Lord, you have for us that you would forgive us our sins with your life's blood. As we share it together this morning, we're united in spirit as we drink together. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Take and drink and do this in remembrance of Jesus Christ. As we gather this Sunday, I recognize that I'm in this building alone except for Steve, and uh, we're not really together in one sense of the word. And I miss that greatly. But one thing I always recognize is this next piece that Jesus talks about when we take communion. In verse 29, I tell you the truth. I will not drink the, this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it anew with you in the Father's kingdom. This was Jesus' farewell. And I think that each time, maybe as I get older, I recognize the fact that when we have this meal together, we do it as a body. And it's possible that the next time we do it, some will not be with us. It's a way of saying what we're doing is important and we do it together. Folks, we're going through a hard time. And this crisis 
in one way is driving people apart in space, but together in heart. I nudge you each to take a time this coming week to be in communion with each other, to maybe across a distance uh, with a phone call or a WhatsApp or a Snapchat or some kind of app like that, take time to share with each other. Now, you may not be able to share your, your breakfast or a cup of coffee like we normally do, but just because we can't have the coffee together, let's not give up those times that we can cherish one another and have communion with each other. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we know that you are in charge of all things. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence and your guidance, even at times like these. So, Heavenly Father, as we reach out to our brothers and sisters, as we share time over the telephone, maybe through Zoom links and other apps, bless our time. Bless our communication. Hear our prayers for each other. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Until next time.